What central theme runs through all the Bible? How would you respond, Jesus, the plan of salvation? The cross, yes to all three, of course, but these three important topics unfold against another all-encompassing theme. The great controversy, this theme pervades the Bible, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, the great controversy began in heaven with Lucifer's rebellion against God. At the heart of this cosmic conflict is the issue of God's love. It's a happy Friday. It's Preparation Friday here on Whispering Hope. And we have Dr. K. White and Dr. Wayne Knowles in the house. All week, all week, we've been looking at the topic, Light Shines in the Darkness. And I'm so excited because there's so many things we can unpack from this week's lesson. And so I'm going to ask Dr. Wayne Knowles and Dr. White just to greet us here this Friday morning. And then Dr. White, he's going to pray as we get ready to jump into our discussions for this morning. Well, as the saying goes, it's a wonderful day to be alive. So good morning, good morning. I hope and trust that you have a wonderful day. And as we go into the Word of God, may the Word of God be transformational in your life today. God bless. Amen. Amen. Good morning to everyone. It's always a pleasure to be here on Whispering Hope Sabbath School. And today we know the Holy Spirit is ready to speak to us. This is a very important Sabbath school lesson. And so we're waiting on the Lord today. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father, today we thank you for this new day. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you in advance for the important lessons we'll learn today, lead and direct in our discussion. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> All of our viewers on Whispering Hope or Signs at the Time or Second Advent, a hearty welcome is extended to you. And we're so happy that you're on with us this morning. And so our topic, light shines in the darkness. Doctors, what comes to your mind when you think of the topic for this entire week? Yes, I think this is a very significant topic as we consider the theme that we're looking at this quarter, the great controversy. And I think it's also a very encouraging um, topic, light, light shines in the darkness. As we consider the great controversy, the last few weeks, we've been speaking a lot about good and evil. And we've been speaking a lot about, well, Jesus Christ himself and Lucifer. And as we consider the fact that Jesus Christ is the light, uh, we, can, we, all, we can then you know, mention that there is, there is darkness. He's not only the light, but he says in scripture that he is the way, he's the truth, and definitely in this con the context of this lesson, he's not just the life, but he's the light. And so as we consider this topic today, it's encouraging that light will continue to dispel darkness because we see the way good was able to overcome evil, the same way Lucifer himself, he was thrown out of heaven. And so we continue to see that good will triumph. So light will triumph. And I think it's an encouraging topic, even to individuals who might focus a lot on the darkness, that there is hope, even in the darkness, because the light of Christ can make the difference on our planet. It is an interesting topic. It's um, scientific in its cursory view of it. Wherever light goes, darkness disappears. And so if darkness is in the world, from a spiritual perspective, what the world needs is light. And we know what the scripture says. Jesus is the light of the world, which means that he's the solution for anything that the enemy brings at us. So let's see how it goes throughout this topic as we seek to see how Christ makes a difference in a world of sin and Satan's influence. Let's look at our memory text for today. And our memory text comes from John 12, 35. It says, then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light. Let darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. John 12, 35. So unpack this text for us, Doc. I think we touched on it earlier. The text speaks to Jesus' own declaration of himself. And he said that a little while longer, the light is with you. So Christ was about to leave. We know from chapter 13 onwards his last supper and then his last set of speeches and then he leaves. So this was just about the brink of him leaving and he is 
presenting himself as the light of the world. We would not always have the opportunity. We have to take hold of the opportunity when it's near. And so this is a, was an appeal to his disciples and his followers. It's also an appeal to us today. Jesus left temporarily, but who knows if someone dies and don't accept Christ, then the opportunities would have been gone. So Jesus says, walk while you have the light. And walking here means that we are to follow him while we have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. So there is no hope for the one who lives in darkness, who lives under the influence of the enemy. The only solution to the enemy's influence and his purposes, his plans, is to have Jesus Christ in our life. Indeed, Jesus is the light of the world. Amen, amen. And it's a moment of rejoicing because Jesus is the light. He makes it clear, as Dr. Knowles shared to his disciples, that he is the light. And as we consider Jesus being the light, we consider he is the only way uh, to salvation. And so this light also positions us to receive this salvation, which is critical. And it's a very relevant um, passage because it is not just about what is truth and what is error, which is critical, but it's really about salvation. So Jesus is, was indicating to his disciples, continue to follow me. I'm going to leave you, but just continue to embrace that light, the salvation which is available to you. And even today, in 2024, as people of God, there is a similar cry and appeal to us. Embrace the light. Embrace the salvation which is given to us. Because if we're not going to embrace the light, which is Christ himself, and the salvation he offers, then we're going to be in the darkness. And we've been talking about the, the darkness is associated with evil. The darkness is associated with error. And the darkness will definitely lead us to the path which will lead to hell and destruction. So today there is hope as we consider Jesus is the light of the world and we're excited about that. I know there's a, a old song. I don't know if it's in our old hymn though. Hark the herald angels sing, Jesus the light of the world. You know, walk in the light, beautiful light, come where the dew drops of mercy shine bright, shine all around us by night and by day. Jesus, the light of the world. Now there's a a question of importance here, and all the questions are important, but this particular one, I think a lot of people really desire the answer. What is apostasy? Is it a departure from the remnant church or a departure from the truth? Well, biblically speaking, it's when the people of God leave him. The focus is really on Christ. So it's really a departure from Christ. You would have apostatized. In a secondary sense, and I think sometimes as seven Adventists, we only see the secondary sense. When you leave the church and um, we see that as apostasy, it's on our books. We call it apostasy whenever a person leaves the church. But in the biblical sense, in the more specific emphasis of scripture, is when a person leaves their relationship with God. So... That's the primary sense is used in scripture. The secondary sense is when a person leaves the church, we mark them as apostasy. And I think sometimes because the same term is used, we see it as the same thing. But the biblical emphasis of apostasy is when a person makes shipwreck of their faith. A person can leave the church and also leave Christ at the same time. But it's not automatic that a person leaving the church leaves Christ. So from the biblical perspective, when a person would have left their relationship with God. Secondary application, when a person leaves the church, they are no longer in fellowship with the brethren. So we, can't, we count that as apostasy as well. It could also mean leaving the church, they also leave in Christ as well. Yeah, I agree. Doctor knows one hundred percent. An individual may leave the, the the truth, which is which is which is Christ, and we can say that is apostasy, and the person can leave the church. I think it was he was very he was very clear, 
I will speak a little bit to leaving maybe in the church as we consider the fact that we are, are members of the Revenant Church. And as some of the Adventists, we say it with no apology. We believe that this is God's final church with a final message, the three angels' um, message to share with this generation. And we believe when individuals come into the faith, they come into Christ, but they also come into the context of the church, which is the bride of Christ. And so God expects individuals to remain in the ark of safety. The Bible says, you know, do not, uh, do not you know, forsake the assembling of yourselves together as you see the day approaching, as we see the times that we are living in. So what is significant is really having that relationship with Christ. Uh, at the same time, it is important to be a member of his church. As we consider the word apostasy, we realize that there's also a false system. We're speaking about light um, this week. So we look at light in the context of what is truth. And we also look at darkness, which is error. So there is a false system which opposes that which is right and that which is of Christ. And so individuals who leave that system, which Christ has established as his bride, and will go into the false system then we can definitely say that there is apostasy in that context. So it's beyond just leaving the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as Dr. Knowles mentioned, but it's, it definitely is a part of the, the whole concept of being remnant people in these end times and remaining in the ark of safety. The ark of safety, yes, speaks to Christ, but the ark of safety speaks to his literal church on earth. Amen. You know, Tuesday, we're just going back a little bit to Tuesday. The focus was, or the topic for Tuesday was safeguarded by the word. And the opening sentence says, the Bible is infallible revelation of God's will. It presents heaven's plan for humanity's salvation. Since all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Quoting 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. And so our only safeguard is in God's words. How is Satan using similar methods today to subtly undermine the authority of the scriptures? Well, today we see a similar trend as we consider the fact that you know Satan will not change his approach. He will continue to seek to undermine, first of all, the authority of God. Remember, we have been talking about the well, we've been discussing the great controversy that Satan himself was put out of heaven because he wanted to assume the position of Christ. So even today, in 2024, there's an intentional strategy by Satan, as he has used in the past today, to undermine the authority of Christ. And he's doing that by trying to um, undermine the authority of God's word. As we consider the fact that the writer mentioned it in the same lesson this week, that human beings were inspired by God. You read the, the passage, all scriptures given by the inspiration of God. So yes, God was able to use a hu human beings to write the scriptures, but God is the one who inspired them to write. And so in, in these times, you know, there are individuals who will then say, well, they're human writers. And so in other words, they want to undermine the fact that the word of God is really inspired by God himself. We also see human reasoning where individuals want to use their own thoughts, their own ideologies, their own philosophies and interpretation of the scripture to really determine what is right, what is not right. But as we consider the methods that the enemy is using, he's using in these times, we have to really be careful. We have to allow the spirit of God to direct us and so he's using a similar strategy, which he has used to undermine the, the authority of God, to undermine the inspiration of the Bible. But we're confident that God will continue to do what he has to do because the words he said, their spirit and their life. So there's a transformational element in the word where the word is able to transform the sinner. And all attempts that the enemy will continue to make to undermine the word of God, once individuals make contact, with that word, they will be transformed. So yes, there's a similar strategy, but we're confident that God will continue to impact the lives of people through his word. I would say exposure 
for persons who are not skillful in the word. In today's world, that is a major challenge that we have. So the internet has become a playground for the enemy. And so individuals just go everywhere. Anyone has a voice today and uh, they get a following thousands, hundreds of thousands. And so persons may look at the number of followings that a person have. And because a lot of people following, they just believe this person must be saying something true. I think that's one of the ways that being used. There are many websites online, well, channels, especially on YouTube. I'm not the Twitter person and the X and all those Facebook and all that. I'm, I'm a YouTube and online website person. You would find quite a lot of websites that are very critical of scripture and its authority. You would also find a lot of YouTube channels. All they do is to criticize. When you find persons who would have done theology, who all he does, persons, all they do to turn around and be critical of scripture, it does undermine the authority. Some of it is subtle, but on the World Wide Web, a lot of it is very bold today. Once people have following, it creates a sense of boldness. So I think that's one of the tools that the enemy is using. And I think it's going to always create division because exposure without ability to handle certain information always leads to people either running with the wrong information, unproven, untested information. And hence, you would always find that the enemy find you know these opportunities as good playgrounds for him. So I want to appeal to our listeners that we have to study the word for ourselves and use that as the standard by which to measure things. If you look for doctrines primarily and not scripture, doctrines are a combination of scripture or explanations. Look for scripture because people are very skillful explaining things and you may lose your way. Everything, like the Berians, must be tested by Scripture. And so we ought to be strong in the Word, because if we're not, then all these theories, teachings, historical findings that people interpret all kind of how, they're going to trip up. And I've seen so many persons being tripped up. So for me, I think in this great controversy, I think the, the Internet is probably the greatest opportunity for good or for ill right now it's a market for the world and it's a tool that the enemy uses very very well he uses it inside the church to be destructive he uses it outside the church to be destructive so we just have to be mindful that there are many many persons whose only ambition is to create discredit to scripture and i'll just give one last example islam you watch islamic debates in order for Islam, the Muslims, to affirm the Quran, they must discredit scripture. They have to, because the Quran is so different and contradictory to the scripture. The scripture cannot be true and the Quran be, be true. So they basically made it make it their duty to study. They even quote atheists that are against scripture to prove that the scriptures are not to be trusted. So there are lots out there. And I'm just saying to us, allow the Spirit of God to lead us because the enemy isn't sleeping. The internet, the YouTube channels, that's the devil's playground. And he's not just subtly undermining scripture. He's doing it boldly and aggressively as well. Hey Amen. You know, you've answered the question I'm about to ask. So let's go to our next question. It says, Satan's major attempt in the great controversy between good and evil is to malign God's character and present him as an authoritarian and unloving tyrant. How does the evil one attempt to do this? And what is on to his lies? The Apostle Peter affirms that no prophecy is of private interpretation. Doctors, talk to all of us here and make it clear. Well, let me go first, because the whole aspect of 
the great controversy is a conflict over a cosmic conflict between Satan and God because God is not in conflict with anyone. We are in conflict with him. And so that creates the great controversy. And uh, if you're in conflict with anyone, you would want to malign their character, misrepresent them, and that's what the enemy has sought to do to God. And so the question is, how does the evil one attempt to do this? And what is God's response to his lies? We see through scripture that what was said in the Garden of Eden, as our first example, that God did not destroy Adam and Eve because they sinned. God gave them an opportunity to be restored. That's a demonstration of a character of love and willingness to be challenged and willingness to work with us even after we make the right choice. So if he's authoritarian, when he makes a decision, you mess up, you're dead, you're done. But God has demonstrated that he's loving, he's gracious, and uh, his truth will prevail. And that's how God responds, not to just destroy, but to give opportunities for those who do not know better, or even when we know better, but we turn against him that we also have opportunity to change course and be able to do the right thing and follow God because he is truth and he is life as well. Amen. Amen. As we continue to emphasize the fact that the enemy has an intentional plan to undermine the authority of God, uh, the character of God because of his own rebellion uh, as Dr. Noel shared, you know, we look at what's happening in our world. As we consider the state of our world, you, you consider the wars taking place around the world. You consider crime, violence, when innocent children die, um, innocent individuals will be killed because of the wars. Individuals may, you know, question and, and ask the question, where is God and you know, how is it a loving God will allow these things to happen? When we consider even the plight of humanity, uh, you know, I remember when I was uh, doing visitations on, on, on St. Kitts on a particular day of the week after they would have done, you know, major surgeries, especially for those who, who are diabetic. And, you know, they do the amputations and you walk on the ward and you see the plight of humanity persons just coming out of those surgeries and now they realize they've lost a limb and they have to live with the reality. Those kind of situations could allow persons to stop and wonder, where is God? Is he loving? And so there's an intentional attempt because of the evil and the consequences of sin and evil to question who God is. In John 10 and verse 10, you know, Jesus Christ says himself, the thief cometh but for to steal to kill and to destroy. And I have come that we may have life and have it more abundantly. So as we consider who God is, he is a loving God. He says, really and truly, if you look around you, all what you're seeing, it is, it is because there is an enemy whose plan is to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. So even those who are suffering, even those who are overwhelmed, Eternal life is available to everyone that in this world you may lose a limb, but ultimately you'll make it to the kingdom. The wars and the challenges around you may get you overwhelmed, but ultimately you will be rescued when Jesus comes. So there's a consistent theme throughout the Bible, addressing the loving, compassionate, and caring God, even as we consider all the evil and the title of the lesson continues to emphasize it, that the light will continue to shine in the darkness because there is hope even in a distressing and perplexing world because Jesus Christ will continue to be that light and he's bringing hope to a lost planet. So I give God praise today that we can allow the Holy Spirit to teach us but also to expose to others that our God is a loving, loving God. Amen. Indeed, we serve an amazing God. His love poured out for us is still being demonstrated daily. How can we be sure that we do not distort the meaning of scripture 
to achieve our own ends. And we know that there are ministers and churches and people are generally guilty of using the scripture to say what they want it to say. How can we safeguard ourselves against doing such things? I think it's important as we consider the scripture to allow the Holy Spirit to interpret the scripture for us. And Jesus said himself that the helper or the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send, he will teach you all things. So first of all, as we open this, we should open the scripture, take into consideration that the Holy Spirit is there to speak to us. And we have to be willing, we have to be open to listen to the voice of the Spirit. We cannot enter the scripture and begin to read it with our own presuppositions because there are times when we already We've already made up our mind what we want the scripture to say. But if an individual is willing to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, he will speak the truth and they can embrace it. In addition to that, I would say understanding the scripture in its context. The Bible says line upon line, precept upon precept. This week we are looking at the book of Ezekiel. And when we look at, you know, God saying in, in the book of Ezekiel, you know, I will, I will punish you. I will you know, because of your rebellion, I will do this, I will do that. Then you say, wow, you know, if you look at that, that chapter in isolation, without understanding the context, without understanding that God is reaching out to his people, that he gave them warning, and now he's responding, we can say he's not, we might conclude he's not a loving God. So the Bible says, line upon line, precept upon precept. We have individuals who will take one verse as Dr. No shared, those on the social media, they will take one verse and one bit the verse, and individuals are drawn to them. But what about the context of the passage? What about a thorough exegesis of the passage? Understanding the audience, understanding the background, understanding who is speaking in the passage and who the individual is speaking to the author of the, the, the passage. And look at the overall theme of the Bible. And how does this passage line up with the themes? And so all this is important as we safeguard and we prepare and we ensure that we do not interpret the scripture in a way which is not pleasing to God. And we'll lead people down a path to error because of our own interpretation. Yeah, I think this is a very important question. And I appreciate Dr. White's submission in terms of context of interpretation. But I think the question begs a little bit of digging into the text because one word can kind of throw us off. In this context, the question starts with a statement as question four on Friday. The Apostle Peter affirms that no prophecy is a private interpretation. I think the word interpretation is the only use in the scripture. And because of how we use interpretation today, we can get, we can kind of misapply it. And so using the context is important. How can we be sure we do not distort the meaning of scripture to achieve our own ends? Definitely exegetical approach is critical and you don't have to be a scholar you just have to apply the basic <laughs> principles or you read a newspaper basic principle you know you check the source you check to see if what is said who said what why they said it those kind of things but i want us to just touch a little bit on this because i think it's very important just to take it from 19 20 and 21 because private interpretation Sometimes we, we really look at interpretation as interpreting the text. But in this particular passage, we're talking about producing the text. If we go to verse 19, people didn't just produce the text on their own. That's really the emphasis of what Peter is saying here. He said, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. This thing is sure that we have. Where unto he do well that he take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in our heart. So he's saying this, this prophecy, this word is sure. How did it come about? So the interpretation here is not about interpreting the text. It's how it came about. It says, knowing first that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Somebody just come and dream up something, watch something on a TV and say, hey, God said this. It, it's not man-made. It's not me sitting in a corner and watching the news and come up with a, a prophetic word. You know, we have these kind of persons on the TV today. Every news headline is a is an interpretation or everybody has some private message. But what else? It explains how it comes about. For the prophecy came. 
So the emphasis is how it comes, not a private thing, not in old time by the will of man. We don't come up with our own things, not a private little thing that we want to say and how we say it. But holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And I say amen to that. So the scriptures come not of a private explanation or interpretation as some translations have it, but it comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it starts with holy men, men dedicated to God. So they're not doing their own thing, which means we have a sh more sure, more than sure word of prophecy through holy men. And they were not doing their own thing. So we can trust the word because they speak as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So it's not a private thing that a person comes, which means that we do not so much want to follow people. You know, that's, that's the era we come, all these subscribers and followers and likes. We don't want to follow people. We want to follow what Christ says and they measure up with what Christ says. So I just wanted to add that in. That is really speaking about how the scriptures come about uh, as against just because that term interpretation is often used for that as well. But the, the emphasis here is that a person doesn't just come up with scripture on their own. That's really the essence. It's to God that scriptures come so we can trust it because it's not a man-made thing. It's a God-made thing. Well, that's a lot on unpack. And I like your approach, Dr. Knowles and Dr. White. I really hope that as we study God's words that we will give leading to the Holy Spirit. But why might this be easier to do than we realize, you know, distort the meaning of scripture? Well, I would say it's easier to do. Why is it easy, this be easier to do than we realize? It's because we're not paying mind or we're not giving credence. If we really accept that scriptures are given by God, it makes a whole difference. The previous passage is talking about safeguarding the integrity of the scripture. When we know that it comes from God, it establishes the integrity of the scripture. It, it, it makes you not so much question what it says, but seeks to understand. Even if you don't understand, you already know it's from God, so you follow it anyway because it's authentic and you trust in the word of God. So it's very easy to fall in that rut where people begin to distort scripture and that will only happen when people do not recognize that scriptures are given by God. They're not man-made things. They're not shepherds and you found Moses on a hill and he copied this thing all by himself. The messages are very clear. That it is God that spoke to man and gave men the message to deliver. And so it might be easy for some people, but I think once we understand it's from God, it gives us a sense of... Um, trust in the word at all times, under all circumstances. Before you move on, Dr. Norris. Yes. As some Adventist preachers, do we sometimes fall into this rot where we use the scriptures to beat somebody or beat a message to the church? I don't want for us to leave with the impression that, you know, when we think of distortion, we tend to think it's the Sunday churches, but are there any cases of it being applicable to us as Seventh-day Adventists as well? I believe that question is a pastor, why you know? Well, I mean, I'm trying to see if if the person, if the preacher, whether pastor or lay, genuinely believes that he has a message from God for the people, I think he should share that message. If he has certain a different agenda, then I think he has to be mindful because misusing the word intentionally, a person can misunderstand, but when you misuse the word intentionally, I think that is where the challenge is. So I think it's it's one of the risks of using the pulpit. That is to use the word for your own purpose, your own agenda, as against allowing the, the spirit of God to use. But yes, the word is powerful. It's for reproof. It's for correction. It's for instruction in righteousness. And so sometimes it will come across as reproof, but it shouldn't be about a personal agenda. The pulpit primarily is for a congregation. I want to emphasize that. Not for an individual, but for a congregation. An individual, you can always deal with one-on-one, -on -one, right? So primarily, it's for the congregation. 
you can always address an individual matter and you don't that's why a lot of pa elders pastors get in trouble when everybody know who they're preaching on in the pulpit and that's part of the challenge when it becomes you know personalized you can always meet that person talk to that person but the pulpit when you give the message it's often more often than not for the general audience and i want to add here that as pastors and leaders dr Rose wanted me to say something here you know as pastors and leaders we we, we love the, the the members the lord has called us to speak to the members and to encourage them so as dr no shit the spirit of god would give us as pastors and leaders a word but outside of the holy spirit giving us a word in relation to just a revelation from the spirit we are called to visit the members we are called to be close to them and as we connect with them and we visit them and we interact with them we recognize that there's some challenges and there's some some areas that we'd want the holy spirit to do a work hence we so now I've seen some challenges in my in my district. I'm seeing some challenges among the members. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because remember, we're called to strengthen them. And the Holy Spirit now may give me a word to speak to a particular issue that's happening in the congregation. There's nothing wrong with that. But we have to allow the word to speak. There's a difference in you allowing the word of God to speak through the message. And when Dr. Noel shared, and everybody's saying, but the pastor preaching about um sister white today is clay sister white story he talking about when you come out of the text and you, you put him into the text then it's you know they say eisegesis that you <laughs> but if you allow the text to speak the people can only be vexed with the text they can't be vexed with you but it is how you allow the holy spirit to use you to address the issues because pastors and elders who love the flock will have to bring a word which is relevant to the issues and the challenges in the church to strengthen the membership. But it has to be done in a loving way and it has to be the Bible that's speaking and not the preacher doing his or her own thing. I'm going to stop there. That. Yeah, let me just add one more thing because many times individuals come to me and, and say, you're preaching on me today. I have no clue. They know I have no clue. So they know the spirit of God is speaking and he said, just what you're preaching is just my own situation. Who told you about my situation? I have no clue. So when the spirit of God speaks to the word and you're preaching to sins in the church, issues in the church, challenges in the church, people know when the message is for them and not the messenger against them. They can make that distinction. And I think the word must be used as the primacy and not the fact that you know something about somebody. In those cases, you can uh, accept it's a whole church issue. In those cases, private things you can deal with in a private manner. Well, I know we've had a hearty discussion this morning. And so I'm just going to ask for your takeaways from light shining in the darkness. Tell us, what's that one thing you want for all of us to hold on to this week? Yes, I would say do not listen to human reasoning. Search the scripture for yourself uh, the same god who inspired the writers to pen the words that we are reading is the same god through the holy spirit who's able to teach us and today read it for yourself may the holy spirit guide you as you continue to trust in god i would just want to add that i see the word of god as the light in this context thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Both your path and your feet are lit. If we allow the word of God to take primacy in our lives, we will step by step be led in the right direction. So don't follow people. Follow Christ and study his word and you will see how God leads you, leads you into the paths of righteousness. God bless. Amen. I want to thank both of you for sharing so ably with us this morning. Truth is, with Spring Hope Land, there are only two sides. We began by looking at good versus evil. Last, you can look at love versus selfishness. This week, we're looking at light versus darkness. In all explanation thus far in the study of the great controversy, there's no middle ground. If in your mind, you're somewhere in the middle, it means you're on the wrong side. God, in his love for us, gave all of heaven. And he poured out his son as a sacrifice for us. And as we study the great controversy, 
chose you this day. Home. Mm. Well, so, and that's my ending. But this evening, we want to invite you back for Ask Your Pastor series at 6.30. And then at 7, we listen to our young adults as they unpack the inverse lesson. So until I see you tomorrow, God bless.